three. Tuned in to the Navarro Miller Report, featuring the hottest in news, entertainment, sports, sports, and all those topics for the mainstream audience. The Navarro Miller Report. Welcome, everyone, to the Navarro Miller Report. I'm your host, Dave Navarro. And I'm Jeremy Miller. And uh, happy Friday the 13th, everyone. You got to have the crazy music in the background. Aside from it being a bad luck day of me being next to this guy, you know, as usual, <laughs> it is our 30th episode, Jeremy. Nice. Yeah. Woo! Can you believe 30. It? We made it actually that far. It's it's the craziest thing. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I know. I know. No, no, no. No, no, no. More. More. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> no, please. No, please. Stop. 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 <laughs> anyway, so such a pleasure to have everybody join us uh, on this wonderful Friday. For some reason, I kept on thinking that today was like Monday, and I have no idea why. It's like the weirdest thing, I swear. Don't you have one of those? <laughs> don't you have those? Kind of, kind of Interesting. Things? I get, dude, I lose a day all the time. I know. It's it's it's, it's all the time. It's us getting older, I suppose. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> it being the Friday the 13th, it's so funny because this 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 like sound would be appropriate. My dog stepped on a bee. That's the Amber Heard <laughs> with her famous my dog stepped on a bee comment she made during, <laughs> during the trial. I guess her dog had a bad Friday the 13th. <laughs> Anyways. Hey, I'm only upset I'm not traveling right now. I, I love traveling on Friday the 13th. You're I'm crazy. not sure how travel conditions are like now. No, I love flying on Friday the 13th. You end up with a seat next to you. You end up with like easy breezy boarding and unboarding. I mean, it's just awesome because so many people are paranoid. Flights go down that day. I've always loved traveling on Friday the 13th. Well, I think, isn't it like historically... Uh, it has nothing to do with the day itself or it being bad luck. It was like a historic uh, moment that happened centuries ago about uh, what was it like a massacre that happened on the 13th on uh, on a 13th, something like that. I got to admit, that's one piece of useless trivia I am unaware of. Uh <laughs> No, I thought you probably would have known about this. Nope, I've never, I guess I've never been that interested. I've never read up on it or really researched it. That's crazy. Yeah, no, I heard something about that because it was like a huge massacre that happened in the dark ages or something like that on a Friday the 13th. They called it like the the, the, the day of bad luck, I guess, <laughs> because, well, all those people died on that day. So it was bad luck for them. But um, yeah, no, I mean, it's uh, it's historic. You should look it up so you could have another piece of useless trivia. Your I will definitely. <laughs> Anyways, folks, uh, glad to have you here on this Friday evening. Uh, it is the weekend. We're going to go ahead and talk a little bit about entertainment, some stuff in sports. And, you know, as luck would have it, you know, as miss luck would have it or bad luck would have it on Friday the 13th. Uh, Jeremy, you have a very, very funny story to add to this Friday the 13th, especially with this drug dealer's bad luck. So uh, last week we actually had a, uh, a drug dealer. Well, let's start with the sheriff. We have a sheriff's deputy who just happens to check his phone for messages and looks down and sees an unsolicited text message of a picture of a pistol still new in the box with clips and a bag of nicely packaged marijuana. Nice. So he looks at the photo and begins a text conversation about prices with the person who sent it to him. And the person on the other line the dealer uh set up a meeting and had him meet him at work oh where God. he presented him with almost 90 grams of marijuana and a firearm oh my god so this guy will be going to jail for a very long time and here's the funny part it was a complete random mistake <laughs> one number out of place on this text and he happened to get a deputy sheriff <laughs> It's not like he knew this guy had the number in the phone or any. No, he literally just put in a wrong number and texted this. I mean, this guy was dead. I mean, this is fate. He was supposed to go to jail. Yeah, no kidding. I mean, just he, out of all the numbers, 
that he possibly could have, you know, this is in South Carolina. How, how many numbers in South Carolina? He could have texted any number by mistake. He dials one wrong number and texts incriminating evidence to a sheriff's deputy. Worst <laughs> luck ever for that guy. <laughs> that guy, I mean, I just, it's the funniest thing because you've heard of the wrong texts. I mean, hell, even we even we even joke about it because we watched it on that show, The League, how one wrong text, you know, it's like my 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 vag exploded. No, it's, she was supposed to put in my pen exploded. I mean, but this was like one number off to the wrong person that put him in jail to begin oh, yeah. with. Talk about oh, the yeah. worst luck ever. That's I mean, like I said, that's fate. So you did something and you were meant to go to jail. This was, you know, either saving you from something or you did something in the past and it's catching up with you because that's that is the worst luck you could possibly have. Tell me about it, especially did it happen on Friday the 13th? <laughs> no, this actually happened last week. OK, so this was pre Friday, yeah, the pre Friday the 13th. <laughs> right on. And we also have another very weird story. What, what's queuing on up to these days? So in the wacky world of QAnon, we actually have um, a, it's kind of a sad story, actually. We have a bunch of influencers in the QAnon sphere who have convinced a bunch of followers that there is a certain Filipino woman who has sovereign control of Canada and is actually the queen. This is along the same lines of their thinking that, you know, the, the U.S. is actually not a country. We became a business corporation in 18 something and every government since then has been illegal. So this mm -hmm. is, you know, following that same brilliant logic um, that they use. And this woman has over 70,000 followers and she just spouts off about all the things. I'm the queen and this is what's the oh law now. God. And this is what and people are being taken in, especially the elderly who are extremely susceptible to this type of stuff. And basically, she put out edicts saying that utilities were no longer legal. It was illegal <laughs> to be sent a water bill. Uh, electricity bills were now free and did not have to be paid. And all rent was being rolled back to its 1955 uh, prices. Oh my so <laughs> unfortunately, you have a lot of very gullible people in this movement who bit, bought into this and listened to the powerful influencers and stopped paying their bills. And now, amazingly enough, um, they've had their utilities turned off and they're facing eviction and they want to know what's going on. They're questioning the queen, the queen constantly on her Instagram saying, why am I still getting this? They have actually begun berating the um, utility services and calling them and saying, you know, you're sending illegal bills. The queen has said this. Oh, yeah. Oh, my I mean, God. It, is, it has gotten that bad. Jeez, that's insane. These people. Wow. 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 That's that's how that's too gullible, though. I mean, these types of people shouldn't even be allowed to drive. If they're that stupid, oh, it's bad. Well, I mean, again, some people, I agree with that. When you get into the elderly who, oh, you know, yeah, you're getting a little slower. Things aren't, you know, firing on all cylinders anymore. They're, they're being taken advantage of. of course, here. That, I, and, that, that I could go ahead and give a pass to, but somebody that's like our age or younger, believe in this stuff. It's if like, you're buying you're, into that stuff. Yeah. That's on you. That's you deserve to like, At go ahead age. and get evicted and like everything else be taken well, away from you because you're that dumb. That's actually what a uh, few of the judges and people who've been involved with this case now have basically said is that, unfortunately, these QAnon people are going to have to learn the hard way. Well, this is what happens when you follow influencers like they are influencing you. I mean, and they, oh, yeah. <laughs> we're not saying it's a good influence. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing about influencers. We always talk about, oh, influencers this, influencers that. No one ever said if there's good, if that's good influence or bad influence. Everybody mm -hmm. just calls them influencers. So, well, I mean, hey, good luck to them. You know, maybe this will go ahead and teach them not to be stupid. But for the elderly, I do feel bad for them because, like you said, when you get up in age, you start believing certain things. Because I mean, well, I mean, you're just, you're, I mean, especially when it comes to like any type of high tech stuff. You tend to believe it because it's high tech. You don't know any better, you know? So yeah, it's like we always have to watch out for our elderly. People like, like this utilize things the elderly don't quite understand, things that are newer concepts they don't grasp. And then they use very technical jargon that sounds, you know, impressive. Mm -hmm. And of course, I mean, again, if, you know, not everybody, you know, starts declining drastically when they get older, but a lot of people do. 
You know, you're not firing on all, on all cylinders a lot of times. You know, you're not as sharp. Oh, looks like we, uh, looks like Jeremy kind of froze on us right now. So <laughs> oh, he's freezing on us. Jeremy. Ah, you got to love technology, especially when it starts getting hot like that. <laughs> when it starts getting hot like that, we start getting a lot of technical difficulties uh, with us right now, folks. So just bear with us for a little bit. Uh, but yeah, as Jeremy said, it's one of those situations that unfortunately uh, it is what it is. We really can't. Uh, there's not much we can go ahead and do about that. I mean, all we can do is really just watch out for uh these types of these types of situations that happen with uh the elderly we need to watch out for them we need to make sure that they are okay jeremy are you back you're completely oh we're, we're still he's still he's still freezing here let me go ahead and uh he'll, he'll be back here in a minute folks um we got to go ahead and continue on here um, for the time being. So anyways, uh, yeah. So uh, as Jeremy said, uh, you know, I mean, these, these people, these influencers, you need to watch out for what what exactly they are influencing. I mean, it's not a positive influence. It has to be it's you know, these some of these people are a negative influence. We need to just be very, very careful uh, as to who exactly we let into our lives and who exactly like who we have to go ahead and uh, and watch over, especially with, you know, with with people that don't know any better. This is this is something that's very, very difficult uh, on them. They have no idea what's going on so we need to watch out for them we need to make sure that they're okay we need to make sure that they're not uh that they're not taken advantage of or anything like that and uh just you know we just got to watch out for them that's pretty much all we have to do in entertainment news jennifer gray was actually engaged to two a-listers uh and and she confessed her her um <laughs> what what uh triangle she had actually uh between these two train a-listers and it wasn't exactly a love triangle it was more along the lines of it was uh, it was one after the other. So back in the 80s, she obviously was in a lot of movies. She was in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. She was in uh, Dirty Dancing. She was in a lot of movies. And at the end of the day, you know, she got involved with one of her co-stars in Ferris Bueller's Day Off, which, which was Matthew Broderick. And at the time, she basically, like her and him, they, they played actually brother and sister in the movie. Uh, but obviously behind the scenes, they were actually an item. They were a couple. Couple. They dated for a while, and eventually uh, Matthew popped the question with uh, Tiffany uh, uh, Diamond Ring. And what ended up happening was that she uh, she accepted the the proposal, but apparently things didn't work out too well with uh, with Jennifer and with Matthew Broderick. So this is this is like she wasn't living in Los Angeles at the time that this happened. She actually was living uh, out of the state. She was living in a different state, but then. She actually moved from Los Angeles, uh, from I'm sorry, from the state that she was at to Los Angeles and here right after the breakup with Matthew Broderick. And right here is where she went ahead and she went on a blind date with, uh, you know, that she was set up on. Little does she know that she ended up being on a blind de date with Johnny Depp of of all actors that she could have been set up with. And it ha it's just so happened that Johnny was actually had a crush on 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 Jennifer Grey uh, after watching uh, uh, Dirty Dancing, so that right there uh, was something that uh, that basically you know it was something that uh, that um, uh, uh, sorry I'm sorry folks we're we're having some uh, we're still having the technical technical difficulties right now uh, so yeah I mean basically what what ended up happening was that they they dated they they. Uh, they were together for a little bit and actually and this is what happened. It was a week after Jennifer Gray had broken up with uh, Matthew Broderick that uh, that that uh, she met Johnny. And then within a week or so of them dating, Johnny ended up popping the question to Jennifer and she accepted. Uh, they ended up moving in together. They adopted a pet. Everything was going great for both of them. And, uh, well, you know, it was it was fantastic. 
uh, but of course all good things must come to an end that relationship didn't work out too much either uh but uh i'll go ahead and uh you know fill you in on the rest in a few minutes we're gonna go ahead and take a quick break so i can get jeremy back in here uh but we will be right back on uh the stream in just a few minutes uh so that way we could have uh we could get jeremy back in here because unfortunately it, there is uh there is uh some technical difficulties i think it has to do with the weather uh, sometimes that happens within within uh, these uh situations so we will definitely uh come back uh with uh with uh as soon as we can get Je uh, jeremy back in here so we'll be right back folks Hi, folks. We are back. Sorry for the technical difficulties. I guess Jeremy took Friday the 13th to the heart this time, I'm assuming. Hey, not me. Our streaming app apparently is has an issue with Friday the 13th. It uh, <laughs> just decided to go haywire. So we are back. Hello, guys. <laughs> yeah, I, I blame you. Like I said, I've said it before. I'll say it again. It's when in doubt, my fault. blame Jeremy. That's all I'm going to have to say. I uh, understand. Well, we <laughs> well, we left off uh, uh, right before uh, right before uh, yeah, yeah, your system went haywire. Uh, we were just talking about the uh, the influencers and everything, and uh, but uh, we uh, we started actually after you left, I started talking about uh, Jennifer Gray mm -hmm. and uh, the fact that she was engaged uh, to both Matthew Broderick and to uh, to Johnny Depp in the same month. Mm -hmm. And uh, right there, I mean, you know, I explained to everybody that was uh, watching how it all transpired and everything. Um, and uh, at the end of the because uh, she was interviewed by by Drew Barrymore, which is I understand it to be your ex from, you know, way back a while. Many, back. many, 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 many months ago many many moons ago um so uh yeah so she was interviewed uh on the drew barrymore show and uh, she was talking about how uh, everything transpired between uh johnny depp and her and it just so happened it, like i was telling everybody earlier it was on a blind date how she met johnny and uh, through that blind date that she was set up it was like a few like not so long after uh her and matthew had br had broken off their engagement because matthew broderick has had engaged had uh, proposed to her first Mm -hmm. And uh, she moved down here to Los Angeles where she met Johnny in a blind date. And Johnny had a crush on her ever since she saw he saw her in Dirty Dancing. So he had been crushing on Jennifer Grey since then. They set her up and he immediately fell head over heels for her. They got engaged. They moved in together. They even bought a uh, pet together. I mean, it was it was going to be something. They were already starting to think about like having a family together and everything. They were really, really in love. And, you know, I mean, as as all young Hollywood love goes, they broke up with one another. They went their separate ways. And uh, I mean, talk about some crazy stories right there with Jennifer, right? Well, I mean, she was a part of that time and that generation, a beautiful, you know, beautiful young lady. And, um, you know, her and Matthew, from everything I had heard, were extremely serious about each other. But if I'm not mistaken, I believe their engagement ended after his drunk driving crash, which caused the fatality of another person. Oh wow! I believe yeah, she was. I believe she was in the car when that happened, oh. and that was the predecessor to them starting to split up. I could be wrong on that, but I believe that was who was in the car with him when that horrible occurrence happened. She didn't. Um, she didn't. Uh, she didn't mention uh, why the breakup occurred. Mm -hmm. uh, but I mean, I mean, you would know more than anybody. You were there. You you know. Well, you were, I mean, you well, just you, you heard you things, within, but yeah, again, you were within that it, that that. You know, I, I could be off on that. I do know that that occurred with Matthew and that whoever he was dating, who was a celebrity also at the time, was in the car with him when it occurred. And I believe it was Jennifer Grey. But, um, you know, passions run high. I mean, especially you got to remember actors, actresses that passions run high. I mean, we're emotional people. And, you know, if you meet somebody that you hit it off with, I mean, things can go from zero to 60 very, very quickly. Um, but that's, again, one of the Hollywood things you see all the time, that yeah. uh, the bloom comes off the rose at some point and you realize, oh, crap, relationships are hard. Yeah. And yeah. trying to keep them going, uh, especially in this industry, is very difficult. So, oh, um, got it out. I mean, youth. I mean, and youth doesn't even have everything to do with it. I mean, you see Hollywood couples breaking up all the time. I mean, just finally moving on. Older couples. It's it's a hard industry to keep a relationship going in, especially if you're both involved in it. 
here's the crazy part. I mean, in talking about that, actually, you you go ahead and you look at the young Hollywood couples these days. They're getting married younger and younger nowadays, from what I've seen. I mean, it, it's almost like they're the opposite of what it was back then. Before it was like, OK, they're not going to last too long. Now it's like, oh, my God, they're married. You know, so well, it seems like Hollywood is kind of going the other direction. I don't know if it's actually going the other direction. We'll have to give it a little time to see if these marriages actually have any longevity. True. Because, I mean, just the fact that they tied the knot doesn't really change the dynamic. You're still in an early loving relationship in Hollywood. We'll see if it lasts. There are very few that have. I mean, that's just the facts. I mean, Hume Cronin and Jessica Tandy are probably, and I know most of our listeners don't even have a clue who they are. Look them up. Trust me. Amazing actors. Um, but they're probably the only Hollywood couple who was very famous, who worked consistently, who married young and stayed married. I mean, they literally died within, you know, a month of each other, I believe it was, Wow. you know, at 80 something, 90 something years old and were married for over 60 years in Hollywood. That just doesn't happen. That's a rarity. Well, the only other couple that uh, was isn't married but has lasted that long has been uh, has been uh, Kurt Russell and Goldie Hawn. Mm -hmm. I mean, they 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 were they've never been married, but my God, they've been together ever since they did Overboard. That's where they oh, yeah. met, and that's where they you know they started dating since then. That was like what in 80, 86, oh, 87, 86, yeah, that area. So Somewhere around no, that it's time. it's. I mean, you're t you're coming up on forty years together for them. That's pretty amazing. But again, it's kind of the the exception that proves the rule. I mean, you have two couples in the last one hundred years of Hollywood who have actually had a longevity relationship with both of them being in this industry. So, you know, it it doesn't bode well for a lot of people. I mean, I I. I'm always wishing them well. I got to say, I mean, that you brought this up since he got married. I have gained a lot of respect for Justin Bieber. He seems to have grown up. That's what I was to have. He seems to have. Yeah, he ser he seriously seems to have grown up yeah. since him and Haley have married and he yeah. started to take things more seriously. This is a guy I had zero respect for. I mean, Get the out. second the second he spit on fans from a balcony, I was like, you're a piece of shit. I mean, that was just immediately I was done with the guy watching his growth over the last few years, especially since he's been married to her. The changes have been very impressive. I hope it's genuine. And I got to say, if it is, I'm impressed with the guy and, you know, got a lot of respect for him now. So it's not always a bad thing. I hope they can have some longevity. I hope they find a way to make it work and make it last. But going in that early, who? You know, the cards are kind of stacked them stacked against them in this business. True. And I mean, another couple that is also they got married eh, semi young uh, would be Justin Timberlake and Jessica Biel. That's another couple that has actually lasted very. And he they are very much in love with one another. They are inseparable regardless of Justin's, you know, uh, fame and fortune, everything else, regardless of Jessica Biel's fame and fortune. I mean, that that dude is like has his wife's back on everything. You Absolutely. Know? They know they both do. I mean, they're a wonderful couple. It is a little bit different in that they're both in entertainment, but they're both in completely opposite industries. There's no competition. There's no feelings of inadequacy if one is better than the other doing better. There's no there's a whole dynamic you're not dealing with there. I'm not saying that's the main thing that causes them to you know fail or whatever, but you don't deal with that if you're I mean, it's not quite as much if you're not in the same actual industry or type of entertainment. Well, I mean, unfortunately, I mean, with uh, with Johnny Depp, uh, he got married, but to a younger uh, a younger woman. And that and I'm not saying that that had anything to do with the fact that his marriage uh, failed and that they are now in uh, court proceedings. I mean, Jennifer Grey did have something to say about that on the Drew Barrymore show. She said, quote, all I can say about the tri that trial is that it breaks my heart for everybody involved. I just think it's sad and I wish it was resolved and I wish everybody well. So, I mean, uh, that's uh, Jennifer's take on that. However, and this I'm, I'm throwing this in here because mm -hmm. it's not really it's not really something that we do on here. We usually use TikTok to go ahead and give you a blind react, uh, which is a which makes funny for funny uh, for something funny for you to watch and everything. However, in this particular case, I found a TikToker. 
uh, a female TikToker that basically uh, was was in a sense on Amber Heard's side, and a, 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 another TikToker stitched it and decided to rebuttal a lot of what this person was saying. And I mean, I'm going to leave it up to you to basically let me know if, uh, uh, you know, many, uh, many of you on in the comments, if you want to go ahead and comment and talk about this TikTok, because it was something that actually really caught my eye. Check it out. Have you ever seen so many men so interested in a domestic violence case before? Oh, uh, here we go. No, no you, you haven't. haven't. You're right. No, you haven't. And that's a bloody good reason. But we'll come back to that. Have you ever seen so many memes made by men? And women. Look at this cool shit Johnny did in court. Yeah, it is kind of cool that he's remained logical, respectful, polite, and hasn't put up with nonsense questions put forth to him. Like, you know, a mega pint. This is bad. This is going to be bad for us. It's going to be bad for us. Do you mean abuse victims? Or women? And is it going to be bad that Johnny might win a case against his abuser? And it's bad for you? When men get excited about a domestic violence case, don't be excited. When a woman downplays a man trying to get justice, for the abuse he's gone through, take no notice of her. Because that means, I, I always am very wary, no matter what is happening in the world, no matter what the fucking angle is, there's a way to spin it against women, and especially something like this, oh my god, it's gonna be so bad. So let me see if I've got this right. A man is taking his abuser to the court. You're worried that men will make it about women, but you're making it about women where a man is taking his abuser to the court. Is anyone else confused? Like, like there's, there's so many memes about this. Did anyone else see the same energy of the meme of Will Smith crying when his wife told him in front of millions that she was cheating on him? No, no, neither did I. And it's because it will set a precedent and it will shift the paradigm a little bit in how things are talked about and I don't think it will be for the better. Yeah, it might set precedent. It might give fellas hope, fellas that have been abused by their other half. It might give them that smidgen of hope that they can hold their abuser accountable for what they've done to them. Because society lets them get away with it. When have we seen a case like this? We haven't. So yeah, it gives us hope under the fact that you have over 300,000 followers and your concern is what impact will it have on women instead of how good will it make it for all victims to be heard. It's insane. I mean, uh, that, that right there, <laughs> powerful That's stuff. truth. I'm sorry. That's truth. He could not be more dead on. Mm -hmm. that's that's the facts this is not a women versus men case and that's what she's trying to make it that's what she's trying to use to incite her followers to get more views and da 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 that's bullshit sorry this is about victims and the fact is there are women who abuse men there are women men who are trapped in abusive relationships who are embarrassed to say anything or have said something and have been completely disregarded because no one believes it OK, as we've seen, I mean, look at the details of this case that have come out in court that Amber Heard has freely admitted to. She's an abuser. That's a fact. Sorry. Read the facts. They I mean, it's not in her own words. I mean, so it's... I mean, all she's had to respond with is, oh, but he did this to me. Oh, but he she's never refuted the thing she's done, except for sorry, the poop in the bed she tried to claim was, a you know, a prank. Otherwise, she hasn't refuted it. These are in her own words. Yet this woman wants to make this a man versus woman issue. No, this is about victims getting justice. Plain and simple. And the way she like addresses it, you know, this is bad for us. Mm -hmm. us who exactly? Yeah. I mean, exactly. that right I there, love that. You know, that, that right there for her to say us, who us? Are you talking about 
victims or just women? Because I mean, at the end of the day, you know, you know, women are always, you know, and I'm all for equal rights. You know, I lo I love the fact that there's equal rights. It's about freaking time. But at the same time, some women go ahead and, you know, only say equal rights when it benefits them. Mm -hmm. In this particular case, when it comes to domestic violence, they use that as 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 a shield to go ahead and get away with what they are doing. And it's it does wrong. happen. And it, it does, does happen. happen. It does happen. And it's wrong. Not enough people and not enough people speak up about it. And that was kind of this guy's point is that the benefit of all this craziness and all this horrific stuff we've heard and has been, you know, put out into the public is that, you know, maybe it will give m any victim some hope to be able to say something, that there is justice out there. And in this case, it is a man, which is rarely seen, admitting to being abused and trying to get justice for that. I, I, don't, I don't understand how you can look at that in a different way. I understand people have different views. I understand women have been treated horribly, have been oppressed for years, that things still go on, pay gap, all this other stuff. I get that completely. But the the way to make that right is not to swing it completely in the other direction and then have you know discriminate against the men that's not equal rights either you know so i'm sorry i'm on his side 100 he was looking at it logically he was looking at it from the terms of this is something about victims mm -hmm. not a man versus woman issue which is what she was obviously trying to turn this into yeah he was looking at it from a from an objective point of view uh, from a not from a you know unbiased point of view, and that's the way we need to look at this case in particular. There is no mm -hmm. sex, you know. There is no gender in this case. This is I, I honestly it, it it besides the fact that maybe this might give some men in abusive situations hope. I have never looked at this case in any way, shape, or form as a him versus her type thing. I have always looked at this as you know an abuser and a victim. Is it and, unusual? Yes. Oh, absolutely. It is very and, unusual. Uh, unusual to it for it to become so public. But the truth is guys being the abused in a relationship is considerably more common than people admit. And then more common than people talk about. So again, that is the one part of this where yes, maybe a man in the same situation might be able to take hope. But I would hope that any victim who may see justice come out of this would would take hope in that. Like I don't see it. this as man versus woman. And honestly, we need to quit viewing crap in that way. We'd love to go ahead and get anybody's opinions on our stream to, you know, give us your take on uh, what you just saw and what we're talking about right now, uh, because it is a hot topic, especially right now with the with this case that's going to be restarting next week. Uh, we've already heard the the side Johnny Depp's side. Now we're gonna we already started hearing a little bit of a Amber of Amber Heard side. My dog stepped on a bee. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so now this week we're going to actually hear the rest of Amber Heard's side and see if she actually has a case against uh, Johnny Depp because they're suing each other in this whole ordeal. I mean, he's suing her for for uh, for libel and defamation. She's suing him pretty much for the same thing, saying that it's all true. Uh, why are you suing me? This is all true what I said. So it's a mess. It's just a complete mess from top to bottom everything that's going on. So we're just going to have to see this week what happens in that case. I'm sure we're going to definitely be talking about it for sure on Monday, going into next Friday as well. In other entertainment news, the the old uh, television, or actually the old movie, uh, uh, starring Tom Hanks and uh, and Gina Ryder. Uh, Gina, Gina Davis. Gina Davis. <laughs> Gina Ryder's the porn star, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> very different people we very, apologize very different. gina davis yes gina davis you are sorry. a goddess of acting and not a porn star yeah exactly sorry about that that's <laughs> that was a major faux pas by my end <laughs> sorry i was uh, you know 
Never mind. Anyways, moving on. <laughs> we're going to go ahead and uh, edit that one out. No, we're not. We're live. No. No, uh, actually, we're live, so we're screwed on that one. Uh, they're both uh, going to be actually, uh, they're going to be doing a TV series on Amazon Prime called, you know, and they're going to be calling it A League of Their Own, actually. Uh, for, it's a new Amazon series. It's going to be premiering this summer. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm assuming that it's actually it makes sense for that series to to happen because in the movie we see pretty much a very very short version of what happens in the time span during World War II when when the men are off uh, fighting you know the war and everything and the women stay behind and uh, during that time baseball season was questionable whether or not it was going to happen so they ended up creating a women's league mm -hmm. so that way baseball could continue on it was a national pastime for for americans in that time and they needed something something to watch something to entertain themselves and they created this league uh, a female league of, of major league baseball and um it was a success for many years but during the midst during the middle part of the seasons during the years that happened uh you know that they were doing this baseball no one knew what happened we again we got a short version of what happened obviously because it was a two-hour movie or hour and a half well, yeah, we got a short version of just the first season exactly exactly so now we have a tv series that's going to pretty much go through the seasons go through the baseball seasons what happened to all those ladies during the time that they were that they were going to different states and everything and and uh, during the season so that should be actually an interesting take to it um you know we already know the marvelous mrs mazel is coming to an end there's only like maybe one more season left so this i would think that this is actually going to be something that's going to take the place of uh, marvelous mrs mazel in my opinion I think it could. Um, my take on it is is a little two sided. One, I like the idea of going more into depth. I mean, as a history buff of a very cool time of a progressive time in our country when things were changing after the war, um, I find it very interesting. And to see all of that in more detail is intriguing to me. But as a fan of film, that film captured magic. I mean, it really did. It captured absolute magic. The feeling that that film captured was, I mean, anybody who's played sports knows what I'm talking about. And I'll tell you right now, that year that film came out, every single female friend I had who played sports, like their end of the year, end of the season get together, they all watched that film and, you know, I mean, cried and reminisced and it, it, it has a very special emotional place in people's hearts. And I worry that they won't be able to capture the same feel in the show. Um, I think it may lose some of its magic in going into the minute details. I, I find it more interesting, but I think it, it might lose some of what made that film so special to a lot of people. And I mean, you know, we we have to remember that this is I think this is like was this Penny Marshall's uh directorial debut? I, I think it was. No, it was right? I don't think it was her debut. She had already she, directed a couple I believe of she I think she had done one or two films beforehand. I mean, nothing this was definitely her biggest project. Oh yeah. But I do, but I do not believe this was Penny's first directing uh directing job. I mean, and this is this is actually uh, this uh, uh, they're they're taking it from uh, Penny Marshall's uh, you know movie, but the creators of this series uh, is are Abby Jacobson and uh, Will Graham. Uh, they are they are uh, they pretty much are the ones that are that are reimagining a league of their own and mm -hmm. making it and making it into a series, which again is something that's incredible. Uh, you know, Graham went ahead to say, quote. Every single one of the women that we've spoken to and the stories that we've read, they knew that they were living at one of the most turbulent times in history. Um, sorry, uh, <laughs> this thing keeps on like screwing up on me. Uh, all of the rules were shifting and somehow in the midst of that change, they managed to find themselves and find a clear idea of who they were and they got to play ball which is the thing that uh, they all talk about wanting to do more than anything. They loved the sound of the bat, the sound of the cleats. For me, and I think for Abby too, it's been life-changing to be able to be immersed in those stories. We just want to share that same feeling with everybody else. So, I mean, again, you know, they really, they really go ahead and, and, and get the heart 
of what this show is going to be. I'm looking forward to it. I love the movie. I, I love the movie. I mean, I love Tom Hanks, you know, his character. There's no crying in baseball. I mean, that quote just cracks me up every time I see I see it. I, I'm looking forward to it. No, like I said, I think it'll be very interesting. I just from a, you know, from an industry standpoint, I worry that they won't be able to capture that same magic. It was a very special film that captured a very special feeling. And I think maybe delving into the minutia, as interesting as that will be, um, and as much fodder for good storylines as that will be, um, might take away from some of that magic. That's my only concern. We'll just have to wait and see a league of their own premieres uh, this summer. So check your local listings on Amazon prime uh, in other entertainment news. Ice T has a message for young artists. Jeremy, this is a story you actually found. Yeah. Uh, Ice T actually tweeted out a message to um, young thug and gunner uh, who are facing uh, very bad <laughs> federal charges, Rico charges right now in connection with a gang they are a part of. And uh, all, all Ice T tweeted was it's easy to make the streets think you're a gangsta. It's hard to convince the feds you're not via <laughs> Ice T. And again, that's sage advice, man. I mean, this is a guy who came up from the streets, who left that world behind, who has been become a producer and an actor and a singer and a songwriter and a who has made something of himself. And that's my point is every one of these guys who get into the rap game, who get into sports, who get into anything to try and get themselves out of the life that they have been leading to get away from the violence in the streets and to make it big, well, then they try and stay street. You know, it's like they they want to they don't want to abandon all their friends. Well, I'm like, the reason you did this in the first place was to get away from that. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't stay a gangster and be a professional. True. You can't. It's not possible. You can't be a gangster who's killing people and dealing drugs and committing crime left and right and be a professional. True. You know, you, you just can't do it because you're going to be doing things that put you in conflict with that constantly. And guys like, you know, Ice-T, guys like Snoop, guys like that have come a very long way. Now, are they connected to the streets? Yes. They still have friends? Yes. But are they doing dirt and in the game? No. They left that behind a very long time ago. And you see it with athletes all the time, too. I mean, you constantly see athletes, guys who've got $30 million contracts, getting busted for dealing drugs with their old homies. Aaron Hernandez. You know, it's like, Another what example. in the hell are you thinking? So, I mean, this is sage advice from a guy who has been there, a guy who has come through all of it and has made something of himself. You know, and, is... and I know that the street cred goes a long way in the rap game. I mean, it does. That's just a fact. Every single rapper, even whether they were involved, you know, everybody in that industry and in that style of rap, whether they were actual gangsters or not, are always trying to portray themselves as hard and street and thugs. And and the fact is, the reason you got into this is to get a better life. Very and true. The only way you're going to get that is by walking away from what you were trying to get away from in the first place. Very, very true. And uh, and I mean, those names real quick. Uh, uh, Derek's on on the stream right now. He says, uh, sorry, I missed most of this. We'll have to catch the replay was watching the ISS flying by. Uh, don't worry about it, Derek. We actually had technical difficulties. So, I mean, we had to stop for a little bit and we're, we had to restart again. It's all Jeremy's fault, really. Oh, but nice. um, <laughs> I'll have a edited version of it uh, on on the stream uh, when when, uh, you know, by by tomorrow. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, in those two Two names that you mentioned right there, Ice-T, Snoop Dogg, you could consider them the lucky ones. They are the lucky ones that actually were in the life, allegedly, and came out the other side well, still here. I mean, there's no allegedly with Snoop. I mean, there's if you've talked to anybody who was involved in that life, they will tell you Snoop was for real. Okay, I've heard stories. If he ain't telling them, I'm certainly not telling them either. But I've heard <laughs> stories. Believe me, he was no Snoop was no joke on the streets. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I'm not arguing. 
but I always, as but, you know, as as journalists, I always have to say allegedly because yes. you know no, I, I, I understand. I can never, I can never go ahead and say for sure, for sure, unless you know it's been made public. Obviously, I understand. But, uh, I would counter that with. Yes, they were lucky to be able to survive the street game to get to the point they were, but I do not believe that they are lucky to have made what they are of themselves. They made that choice. Yes. They made the choice to leave that life behind and move forwards. That's why they've gotten where they have. Now, were they lucky to make it out of the street game when they were involved as long as they were? Absolutely. But for them to get where they are, that was not luck. There's no luck involved there. They made the choice to not be in that life anymore and to be professionals and take their career seriously. And they did, you know, so I would I would argue that part was not luck. Correct. Yeah. And I and I agree with that. And uh, uh, the other thing, too, I mean, we have another perfect example. I mean, and I don't know how accurate this was, but. Uh, in the movie Notorious, which is the biopic of Notorious B.I.G., I mean, Puff Daddy was telling him, Big, you got to get out of this life. I mean, I have this music for you. I mean, you, you either choose to live a life of, of crime and gangs and drug dealing and everything else, or you choose, you know, music, which you're good at, you're, which you're amazing at. You have fans. I mean, you need to get out of this. You know, I mean, I'm not going to I'm not going to be here trying to like, you know, be next to you, trying to bail you out or anything like that. You either choose this or you choose that. You can't have mm -hmm. both because that hurts me. And at the yeah. end of the day, it hurts me, my career, my credibility, my life, my business. And I'm not going to allow that to happen. And, you know, I mean, big. He chose the other way. He chose. You know what? He's right. I don't need to do this gangster stuff anymore. I don't need to do this. I have a career. I have something. This is the, the reason why I was doing this gangster was because I didn't have a career. I didn't have a path. That's now exactly I have it. One. Now I have one. I don't need this anymore. You know, time to leave this behind me. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's 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 choices. It all boils down to the choices that we make in our life, whether we go left or right. You know, you can't have in this particular case. There is no middle. There is just no way. So. Uh, hopefully these uh, these young artists that are coming up, they listen to, you know, an OG, you know, an original gangster such as Ice-T, which he is, uh, allegedly. <laughs> I will keep saying that. Uh, and, uh, you know, they make the right choices in life and uh, we'll see what happens there. In other entertainment news, a sad day in Hollywood today as actor and legendary actor, actually, I should say, Fred Ward passes away today at the age of 79. Uh, he's very famous for being in the movie Tremors and amongst other uh, credits that uh, he actually had. And Jeremy, I mean, you have a lot to say about this. Well, I mean, again, I just we've lost another icon, um, you know, a character actor who worked a lot of small roles, who had a shot uh, at being a A-list action star. Um, a lot of people believed he was the up and coming action star of the late 80s. And unfortunately, he got tied into a film called Remo Williams, which was mm -hmm. just god awful. And it kind of put an end to that for him. But again, he continued to work. I mean, this is a guy Tremors, one of my favorite films as a kid, um, you know, saw that 100 times as a kid, loved it. He was in uh, The Right Stuff, one of my other favorite films as a kid. Um, he was i mean he was one of the astronauts in that he he Henry has a June, the player yeah, oh he has laundry list of credits i mean recently he was uh had a he played um colin uh colin farrell's uh oh yeah <laughs> father yeah, in true crime and and wasn't and, he, wasn't he in uh i think he was in freddie got no was he in freddie got fingered he might have been in Freddy Got. Yeah, I think it was Freddy Got. He did a ton of character roles, and Fred really was a throwback. He had that gruff quality that you saw in the old 1920s, 1930s stars. He had that bogey, Cagney, Cary Grantish kind of rugged. I mean, maybe talent wise, chops wise, not quite on the level of those guys, but he still had that feel to him. I mean, and it made him an amazing character actor. It's why, again, I have so much respect for guys who made a living in this business working small roles. The guys who you say the name and most, you know, 90 percent of casual fans would go, who? 
Yeah. But as soon as they see the picture, they're like, my God, I love that guy. That's who Fred Ward was. And it's it's a loss. Again, small part actors like that who bring so much to a role and so much to a film. You know, they're always those guys you remember afterwards. Um, that was that was who Fred Ward was. I mean, he was even in uh, he was even in uh, uh, part of uh, of of a cast in Two Guns, which starred two A-list uh, actors, Denzel Washington and Mark Wahlberg. Uh, you know, he was in that as well. So, mm-hmm. I mean, the first time I saw him was actually in uh, in uh, in uh, Road Trip. He played the father in Road Trip, actually, which is freaking hilarious. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, he was just like, one of was... his great roles. He played the uptight detective father. Well, and no, he, wasn't even a detective. And... he wasn't even a detective. He was just a dad that was just investigating what no, had happened. He was a, detec- he was no, a detective. No, yes. not in. I have yes. the movie. I know this. He so was I've seen it 40 times. He pulls his gun and his badge at the yes, end of the Yes, because he's a father. He wasn't a detective. He was not a detective. Gun and badge. No, gun he and not. badge. Okay. At the end of the film. We're going to have Go to watch, watch it. it. I'm going to watch it again. And I can guarantee you he was not a detective. He was just a dad. Because he cop. never, he ne- nope. no, he was not a cop. He was just there. Really? The cops why, at, was. why at the police? Why at the police station, or at the uh, crime scene where they find the car, where all the detectives deferring to him and giving him all of the information on because the case? He was a fa- because he was a father that was Go looking for watch. his son, and I they will know- appreciate your apology on Monday. I'm not going to apologize. I've seen the fans. movie a million times. I know it. it. Oh bye. He is not a cop. They never say, even in the credits, he doesn't come up as a cop or a detective. He only comes up as a father. He is the father of the kid. They say it. You Uh, will tell me on Monday. You're sorry. You're wrong. You're wrong. You're going to tell me. I want you to watch it, and I want you to apologize to me on Monday, because I I guarantee you, he was not a cop. Absolutely, he was. No, he was not. No, he was not. Anyways, <laughs> point is Hollywood lost a legend. And, uh, you know, we're very sorry for this loss again eight, at the age of 79. I mean, that was a long, a pretty long life for the oh, most yeah. part. I mean, almost in 80 industry. years old and a long career that brought a lot of joy to a lot of people. You know, I mean, this is a very accomplished man who being in the industry as long as I was, I, I never heard a bad word about him. You know, it was heard good things about working with him and you know great guy on set so he seemed like a hard ass he he looked like a hard ass because he had that he had that he had that old school gruff kind of you know persona but it could play soft and warm and caring and it could play you know tough and and uncaring and evil he was a very very talented actor and uh it's a it's a sad loss for the community Incredible loss. Our condolences go to his family and all of their loved ones. Uh, in other, in other, uh, you know, uh, switching a little bit here, switching up a little bit here, uh, going into as we have a uh, custom to be doing here on the Navarro Miller Report, a nice little uh, TikTok blind react uh, towards Jeremy here. And uh, the, the first video that I'm going to actually show here uh, has to do with a uh, comic that uh, had a very interesting take uh, about his uh, ex-girlfriend. Go ahead and check it out. So I'm single now. My, uh, my last girlfriend, she was interesting. Her favorite food was Japanese noodles. And she cheated on me with five guys no condoms. So, <laughs> <laughs> you can say she loved ramen. <laughs> That's what I have to give for that one. Another one for you. <laughs> okay. Absolutely horrific and cheap joke that scored. I mean, that. Has... <laughs> and I think the woman, the young lady in the front row, I think that probably was his ex girlfriend because she was. Maybe. Off. But that was some serious low hanging fruit, but it worked, man. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, obviously, like, those, you got a lot of laughs for that. It was like, like. Definitely deserve the rim shot for that one. Uh, this other video, actually, um, <laughs> this one's a little bit close to the heart, Jeremy. And uh, when I play this, you're going to know why it's close to my particular heart. Check it out. Oh, ah, shit. What the fuck is that? I'm dying. <laughs> a 
did she did I, you didn't you make a few of those i get i get that phone call like twice a week <laughs> <laughs> Say my twelve thirty at night, my phone rings. You, I'm dying. You have any idea how much I debated not playing that today? I was like, if I play that video, I'm like, if I play that video, I swear I'm never gonna hear the end of it. Ah, screw it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing it for the show. Damn it. <laughs> oh my god. And 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 accompanying that video, I have this one actually that kind of explains that one in a sense for a lot of people that are crossing over that certain age we had a lot of good times i know i'm really nice. okay yeah, i'm ready to soak on by nice knowing you come on in and take a seat we've been waiting for you today's gonna be super easy we're just gonna go through some updated protocol and you'll be on your way all right sound good i don't think i really have a choice so pain everywhere places you never imagined your toe bones your elbow butts fabulous drinking we're gonna cut that down about 99 <laughs> percent Oh, wait, seriously? Do you need to remind you about your crippling anxiety and your two day hangovers? Oh, that's true. It's only gonna get worse. Got it. You're gonna feel bloated and crampy. Oh, well, we already have that problem. And shit your pants. Oh, that's new. Yeah. Okay. Anything good. You don't give a shit what people think about you. Wait, I give zero shit. Okay, maybe not zero shits, but less shit. I'll take it. You give less shits, but you take more shit. Balance, baby. Yeah. You have adult money now. And you set healthy boundaries. Stop it. I love this already. Girl, I know. Who am I? Oh, wait. I just forgot. I have something for you. You did not. Oh, just a little something to keep on you at all times. Oh, thank you. (laughs) Welcome to your 30s. Yeah. And she even actually gave her the Tums right there at the end of the day. That was something that uh, apparently she needed, which is we all what we all need when we cross over to the 30s, apparently. And it's so funny because that part where she gives little, you know, whatever, that reminds me of you. That's exactly what you usually say. It's like the older I get, the less I care. <laughs> That's the truth. I'm sorry. I, I and again, you know, I was I never had the old uh, you know age milestone worries and stuff like that. And crossing thirty didn't bother me. Crossing forty didn't bother me, and fifty doesn't scare me. I I know my body's deteriorating. I've been old for a very long time physically um, and mentally. So it's not. <laughs> well, yeah, I was born an old man. My mother Pretty always much. said so. Um, but no, truthfully, it's. I, I like the video. It's it's just too true. I mean, things start breaking down. You got to change everything. And I mean, my family, one of the biggest things for the men in the family was we could eat whatever the heck we wanted, literally, and never gain a pound. I mean, had trouble putting on weight for sports and stuff mm, like that. I hate you already. And the moment every man in my family turned 30, that was over. And I'm talking like the day of at 12.01 it was over. I mean, weight just started appearing and I started having to change, you know, diets and, you know, change the things I was eating because I could eat as much of whatever I wanted. And we never put on weight. It was just something the guys in my family, I mean, we just burned it off so quick, but I'm telling you at day at year 30 and one minute, (laughs) oh God, that was over with. All of a sudden it's like, bam, the stomach just came out of nowhere. Like where the hell, what the, what in the world just happened? I'm not kidding. It was within two months of having turned 30 and still eating normally. And I had packed on like 10 pounds in two months. I was like, what the hell is going on? And I had to start actually paying attention to what I eat. Yeah, I'm not looking forward to 30. <laughs> okay, you shut your mouth, okay? No one knows. Thank you. I needed that. You stay I out of this, that. okay? No one knows, okay? <laughs> I really don't like you. Anyways, <laughs> that's our, our little uh, fun TikTok uh, uh, do, uh, re, uh, react challenge, actually, or blind react challenge for, our, not challenge, but blind react for Jeremy right here. I know he loves those very much. I know I love uh, finding them, especially those last two. Those <laughs> took the cake for him. I already know, especially those because especially because especially one of them I could actually uh, relate to, and he knows I can relate to. Derek is saying... Uh, um, uh, it says that, oh, oh, this is from the plot of Road Trip. Meanwhile, Kyle's father, Earl, discovers the card is maxed. Believing he's been kidnapped, Earl begins searching for Kyle when told by the police that the car was found wrecked and he is missing. Sound like he wasn't a cop to me. Not taking sides. worked with him. You'll see. It's, he Just wasn't watch. A, he wasn't Just a, watch. Okay. 
whatever. And I know he, was just cop. Watch. he wasn't the cop. Just he watch. didn't. He didn't say hi. I'm Detective So and So. Never said that. He never no, showed he a badge. He wasn't on duty. He just never watch. showed a badge. Just watch. <sighs> Whatever. Anywho, moving on. Still trying to move on here. Um, this is something actually. This uh, moving on to sports. Actually, this is a sports story that. Um, well, I mean, it's it's uh, right up your alley, Jeremy. Because I mean, I know that uh, you play tennis badly. Um, <laughs> I had a scholarship, Biatch. <laughs> Whatever. Anywho, uh, but this actually had to do with uh, tennis player Dennis uh, Shapovalov. That snapped at a fan actually during uh, this has actually happened last week and I wanted to talk about it, uh, but I forgot to talk about it last week with you because I know you have a couple of things to say about this. Uh, we talked about it, about it over the weekend, but uh, you thought it was I was uh, talking about some, another athlete, not uh, Dennis per se. Uh, and in a tweet by James Gray at James Gray Sports, he went ahead and tweeted the video of when uh, when uh, Shapovalov uh, went off. It happened, it said, quote, Denis uh, Shapovalov in a heated battle with Lorenzo Sonego at the Italian crowd and the Italian crowd in Rome. Uh, basically, he said, quote, shut the F up. He shouts when booed for arguing with the supervisor. So apparently it was an argument that he was having with the supervisor. The crowd was booing against him for what was going on. And he told the crowd to shut the F up. I mean... You know, in in my opinion, do you think that uh, I mean, because I know tennis players, they may not seem like much <laughs> to many people, not to me particularly, but to many people that I've spoken to, they may not seem like much, but they they're very passionate in their sport and they go crazy. They they go nuts when it comes to the sport. I mean, do you think that this is a clear example of what tennis players usually do when they lose their cool? Well, I'll put it into a little bit of perspective. Um First of all, you have to remember that the loud, vocal tennis players who do this kind of stuff get the most publicity. I mean, the McEnroe's, the Connors, they're the ones you hear about all the time. So it doesn't happen as often as you'd think. But yes, tennis, as any competitive sport, especially played at a professional level, is incredibly tense. It is incredibly pressure filled. And these people are incredibly high strung. This is their livelihood. And again, you only have this is not you don't have a season's contract where you're guaranteed to make this much money no matter how you play. You don't you don't have any of that. All your money comes from what you win, how well you do. You I mean you may have endorsement contracts, you have things on the outside, but there's no guaranteed prizes for playing. You can come in, lose in the first round, and guess what? You didn't make anything that week. That's how it goes. This isn't this is not football or baseball or any of the other professional leagues where you have a guaranteed contract and a certain amount of money you're going to make. These people are playing for their livelihood every single day. True. Second of all, in Rome, 90% of the courts are clay. Clay courts are the hardest to play on. They are the most physically demanding. They are the longest matches. They take an immense toll on your body. And because of the weird bounces the ball takes, it's an incredibly hard surface to play on. Players get fried playing on, on clay. You see a lot of blowups happen on clay because these guys are spent emotionally, physically. They are just beat. So I'm not excusing what he did. You know, there are times when tennis fans are out of line, you know, talking when somebody's serving, doing things at different times when you're not moving around behind a player when you're playing. There's things you are not supposed to do and player people do it all the time. When a tennis player reacts to that and yells at a fan, I feel they are 100 percent within their rights. But if you are already arguing with the umpire and the fans are booing you and you turn and tell them to F off you've just alienated all the fans and now what they're going to do is boo and root against you harder you did nothing but hurt yourself there and that's going to you know? screw up your concentration too especially in that type of match like you said in that type of atmosphere that type of uh tennis court it's already taking a toll on you but physically but mentally mm -hmm. and emotionally the crowd booing is also going to screw with your focus. Oh, yeah. And there's very few people. People have to understand. Everybody remembers McEnroe. I mean, even people who were not fans of tennis remember the stories about McEnroe oh, yeah. and throwing rackets and, you know, calling umpires abortions. And, you know, I mean, just 
He was the best way of tennis, right? He was the one that was called yes, the best way of tennis. Yep. But here's the thing. 90% of it for him was an act. He fed off the anger. John was an old school New Yorker. He fed off that anger and that tension and that being pissed. And on top of that, he knew it got in his opponent's head. He was playing psychological warfare with that. It was all plotted and planned. You know, sometimes he lost it and went overboard, but it was all part of his psychology and what he was doing purposely as different from Jimmy Connors, who was of, of the same time and was known as more of just a petulant, spoiled asshole who treated people poorly and yelled at everybody. They were um, portrayed as very similar characters in the news and in the media and in the sports pages, but they were very different types of people. You're not Mac a fan of <laughs> Well, I mean, I loved Connors as a player. I loved watching him. The man was amazing. But you hear the stories. I mean, he was not liked on the tour. I mean, he was he was one of the most despised players on the tour at the time that he played. And um, McEnroe, that wasn't the case. I mean, some people had a problem with his antics and with everything else, but you didn't hear a lot of other negative stuff about McEnroe, whereas Connors had the same sort of histrionics and blow ups. His was real, though. Yeah. You know, John was playing psychological warfare. So there's a difference. You know, John fed on the booze. John fed on the hate and the anger. You know, I don't know what this guy does, but if he's snapping and yelling at them to shut up, it's obviously bothering him. That was not psychological warfare. That was the fans getting to him. And he certainly didn't help his cause by yelling at them more. Yeah, that's definitely the case. And uh, that happens with a lot of athletes. I mean, but lately, to me, in my opinion, it seems that the fans are really starting to like cross that line between heckling and just being an annoyance to many athletes. We've seen it. We've seen it in the NBA where uh, where fans are getting ejected from the arena because they are taking it too far. They're taking it way too far with these athletes. They need to understand that this is a competitive sport, but the athletes are out there. You're not allowed to be out there either or throwing things, or, you know, and, and there's a line. Start. There's definitely a line. And I'll tell you when I crossed it, um, I took my boys to a Dodger game and we're playing the Giants. And as anybody who knows sports knows, Rivals. I hate the Giants. Any Dodger fan hates the Giants. Facts. Facts. With a passion. Well, now we hate I mean, the Astros even more, actually. <laughs> no, no one will ever supplant the Giants no, in my mind. No, Never. No. Hey, dude, one of their players beat our player over the head with a baseball bat at home plate. Okay? That is true. That is true. I'm sorry. There will never be any, any respect or like between our teams. But I took my boys, and instead of just booing when players got up or whatever, I found myself joining the crowd and screaming for the first five innings at Bonds in the outfield, steroid user, as loud as I could. I mean, top of my lungs screaming with the entire stadium. And it wasn't until at about the fifth and a half inning, I look down and I see my eight-year-old son screaming the exact same thing mm. that I realized I had gone too far. Okay. Bad example. Big difference between booing and taking something personal like that and attacking an athlete. True. Sure. Um, and that's even, that's even less than what you were talking about, which is, you know, interfering, throwing stuff, doing things like that. But even that for me was crossing the line. I went way too far with that. And I allowed myself to get caught up in the kind of mass hatred and anger and hysteria. Um, or was TMZ and, back then when you needed them. <laughs> and I, you know, I backtracked and had a little talk with my sons about, you know, that was a mistake of me doing that. And we had a conversation about it. But again, Fans have gotten worse. I mean, it's just a yeah. fact. People are more entitled nowadays. People feel oh, yeah. like, you know, they can do whatever they want. A just because they times. pay for a ticket, they're, they're allowed to go ahead and they own the player or they own well, the team. And truthfully, that's been an attitude that's been there underlying for many years for some people. But it has gotten a lot worse. 
and we're seeing the results of it. I mean, as you said, fans getting kicked out here and there. Um, I mean, at a football game last year, uh, a fan actually threw something at one of the NFL players and the player like swung at him and they wanted to like get on the player. I'm like, I, I don't think so. You're going to throw a beer bottle at my head. You're lucky. I don't, you know, well, so, they're also you know, looking for that payoff. Of course they are, but they're looking for that, you know, they, they come from the Sumi state. The fact is fans have got to keep it under control. There are two sides of it. Athletes are only human. You can't expect them to be. I mean, they may perform like superhumans, but they're not superhuman. You cannot cross the line with these people and expect everything to just turn out fine because, oh, well, I'm a fan. I can do what I want. No, that's not how this works. Nope. And eventually it's going to get someone hurt. More, 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 more. That's factual right there, actually. And, uh, you know, one one player in particular that uh, might be switching his own fans, actually, from one end to another is uh, in uh, James Harden, actually uh, switching stories here to the NBA. Uh, James Harden's future with the 76ers is kind of questionable at this point right now this i'm reading actually from cbs.com it says quote james harden has had so many opportunities to secure his financial future the houston rockets offered him a 50 million dollar per year extension in 2020 he turned it down brooklyn brooklyn nets general manager sean marks expressed optimism before this season and he would be able to get harden to sign an even bigger extension roughly 161 million dollars over three years in addition to his ex ex existing contract but harden again declined he even theoretically could have signed a long-term extension immediately upon being traded to the Philadelphia 76ers. Instead, he missed the deadline to pick up his $47 million player option for next season. He'll have another chance to do so after the season, but the message here has been clear. Harden has prized himself, oh, I'm sorry, his personal flexibility above financial security. That right there pretty much says it all. Well, at this point, if if it's really just about that type of flexibility and everything else, more power to him. I mean, if he doesn't want to sign the long long term contract and doesn't care as much about getting that six or seven year deal where he's got all this secured money, you know, coming in. Hey, more power to him. That's his choice. Um, but there are other aspects of this. You know, James Harden has kind of burned bridges wherever he's gone. You know, and in Oklahoma with him and Kate, uh, Kevin Durant, mm -hmm. I mean, they were one of the best duos in the league, but from stories, I mean, I wasn't there. I don't know. But allegedly, you know, Harden couldn't handle, handle uh, you know, sharing the spotlight. He wanted to be the king. He wanted to be Jordan. He wanted to run it all. So, you know, he left and then KD left and then he goes to Houston and it doesn't work out there. And he goes now to Philly and it doesn't work out there. He's been and he team hopping goes, for years. The fact is, at some point, it's not a team problem. It's a you problem. If mm -hmm. you can't get along with these people and make it work with your talent, that's on you. Antonio you know, Brown. Oh, oh, sorry. You know, um. the stories about this guy are are legendary at this point. He burns a lot of bridges. You know, he's he seems to have quite an ego and it's not going over well. I mean, yeah, he can piece together a career going from team to team every two or three years, but Unless you get lucky and sign on with somebody who's prepped to win the championship, he ain't going to get a ring. I mean, I mean he's, he's 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 slowly but surely becoming the the NBA version of Antonio Brown. Yeah, I a mean, little bit. I mean, it's it's very it's very much similar to what AB was doing for a while. Mm -hmm. You know, going from one team to another, and like you said, sometimes it doesn't become a team's problem; it becomes a you problem. That and that's that's the issue right here. By the looks of it, with Harden, Harden's trying to like raise his stock. And what he's doing, he's debilitating it more and more by his by the way he's doing things. By Absolutely. going, I mean, every team is going to look at him as unstable, unsure, and uh, unstable as far as staying with the team, not himself mm -hmm. personally, obviously not right. psychologically, but unsure of whether or not this player is going to stay with them. No one's going to want to go ahead and invest in a player that this season he's going to be with us, and then halfway mid season he's going to go to another team. Or he's, he's going to decide trade. he wants out and now he's not going to try as hard for you guys. Or, I mean, there's all sorts of things that he's been accused of doing. And his incredibly lethargic performance in the playoffs has kind of solidified that in a lot of people's minds. 
I mean, a lot of people are under the impression he's just given up. And if, if yeah. you're a GM, is that the guy you want to sign to a $30 million plus a year contract? I don't think so. That's the guy that you're like going to be scared to even have. Cause mm-hmm. it's just, it's somebody that's unpredictable. It's, un- it's unpredictable. And quite frankly, we have no idea what's going to be the future of James Harden at this point with the 76ers or in the NBA period. We have no idea. So, but uh, that's the news in case you haven't heard it. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in to the Friday the 13th, 30th episode of the Navarro Miller Report. I'm your host, Dave Navarro. I'm Jeremy Miller. And uh, make sure you join us again every Monday and Friday from six to seven, Jeremy. Hopefully, your freaking like system will not fail you. Talk to our streaming app. <laughs> for the love of god make this work make this work um other than that uh you know on saturdays i wanted to let everybody else know as well that uh on saturdays uh if you follow me on tiktok i do a little bit of music uh because we're allowed to on tiktok thank god um they apparently have license so i'm able to play some uh some hits from 90s uh to 80s to you know present hips everything from pop to rock and everything in between so make sure you join me on my tiktok page Uh, i'm trying to do it every saturday at 4 p.m definitely tune in i mean you got to listen to him a little bit which you know i know is obnoxious but the music's pretty good so definitely tune in guys thank you thank you for that kind of like uh halfway slap in my face but complimentary uh you know endorsement that you gave me there jeremy appreciate it <laughs> always love you brother always love you here's and this is i'm doing this in hopes that you get a tiktok anytime anytime that. <laughs> that's pretty much what we have to hear every time i say that uh but other than that go, go ahead and uh, make sure to follow us on our youtube channel for those of you that don't uh, watch us live and only listen to us some of the tiktok videos are funnier when you watch them in the video so make sure you subscribe to our youtube channel so you can see some of the videos and uh, jeremy's reaction to the tiktok videos that we feature on each episode make sure you link uh the link is in the description below uh make sure you follow us on on youtube and again we're here every monday and friday from 6 to 7 p.m pacific standard time so make sure you tune in that's all for us we hope to see you next time right here right same bad time same bad channel every monday thank you so much for listening and we will see you all next time you have been listening to the navarro miller report 